curiosity. They were interested in the topic and the teacher helped them find resources, helped them find websites and information for them to develop that. And when their class praying mantis died, they even turned its funeral into a project that involved writing and reading. And the great thing about this, and I can remember doing uh, really similar fun projects, is that you don't realize, oh, I'm taking in this information. I'm learning a great deal. It really kind of creeps into your head. Oh, look, I need to turn this S around, or I'm going to be writing this. And uh, so I, I've had some great experiences with that. And the teachers in this video you can see really seamlessly incorporated technology. They uh, were using the interactive whiteboards to show letters and websites. They were creating a website for the funeral of the praying mantis, uh, and they were helping students research the airplanes. And so we know that we can create this innovative technology, an innovative classroom with the help of technology. But technology itself isn't this good enough. If you have something and it's malfunctioning, then you need people to help you out. And so I've been really lucky here at this conference, so there's some wonderful people here. But another huge resource that I see being used all the time in my own home and in many others uh, is young people. So raise your hand if you've ever asked a kid for help with something technology related. So you raise hand. Uh, and so for me, my mom has asked me, you know, how do I add something on the site that we have here? Etc. And so young people uh, like myself are always really willing to help. And if we have expertise on something, then we want to share that. I think that the reason behind this is again, not because we're just naturally better at technology, it's because we've had to adapt and we've seen all these new technologies coming in since we were born. It's a commonly accepted reality that today's youth are more skilled with certain technology tools than sometimes our parents or grandparents. And maybe it makes you a little more comfortable scary that we're kind of uh, advancing maybe with these faster than you are. But um, if you find yourself in this position, it's really okay as long as you're open-minded to catching up. So my dad is a great case in point. Uh, his name is John Sitok, and he's in this picture. And so my dad is what you would not think of as an early adopter. He's kind of the opposite. So when cell phones first came out, he said, what do I need a cell phone for? I have my work phone and my home phone, and I should be talking in the car. And when, uh, and when computers, oh, and another thing, when computers first came out, he was still like typing on a typewriter, and his typing is horrible that actually people took pity on him in college and typed up his papers for him. So uh, that's just saying, early adopter, definitely not. So when Facebook came out, he was not quite on it until last October, and he is really, really into it now to the extent that my sister and I are like, Dad, stop liking everything. It's kind of weird. And uh, so my dad, was asking us lots of questions about Facebook, he was really into it. He wasn't like, oh, you know, I don't like that you guys know more about Facebook, I don't like you know more about what I'm doing here. Uh, I, okay. uh, I don't like you know more about these things. He would ask us questions, and it was really nice because usually we're the ones who are asking our dad questions. What's the only way I can be able to watch it? How do I solve this inequality? So to be in the position of a teacher to say, here's how you set up a blog, let's work through this together, here's how you make a new post on Facebook, that was a really empowering feeling for me. So I set up a blog for him, I got him on Twitter, showed him the addictive cell phone game app, Angry Birds, and <laughs> various other things. The, and the funny thing is, my dad being online, he's after Angry Birds, might actually equal more in-person conversation because suddenly it's, oh, well, how do you do this? And this is a really interesting feature that I think he's should take more consideration of. I just got to level 21. And uh, other than, so I encourage all of you to do the same, whether you're at home and you're asking your kids, how do I do this, or in school. Um, those of you who work with middle and high school students who are really into their cell phones, you might look at that as a really a negative thing, that we're into Facebook, that we're into social networking. But you can turn it into a positive by asking students to put all the energy that we put into posting hundreds of pictures of ourselves, put that into creating a class website together or maybe uh, updating a blog that blogs the class or something like that. So when you just repurpose some of all the energy that goes into the social networking that maybe doesn't have an educational purpose to something having to do with education, I think uh, that creates a really powerful experience. Put my teacher hat back on you for social networking. Some of you in the audience might think, oh, LOL, OMG, and are you a poopy quizzes? So Facebook definitely has applications for totally useless things. And there is a lot of shallow communication going around that is just three letters. But I've seen a lot of evidence that shows that students use Facebook, Twitter, cell phones every day for more than just uh, talking 
on their cell phone, cell phone through talking with friends. For instance, uh, take a look at the profiles or the um, status posts of some of my friends. Um, this, uh, Priya said, I think they present the Spanish skit tomorrow, so I'm going to memorize the lines. And there's a discourse going on about homework, inside jokes about something I'm going to do in chemistry. And so people are really using these tools for uh, many different purposes. And I'm one of those kids. From a really early age, I was using the internet to dig around for learning resources. Because I started reading chapter books at three and a half, and my parents decided not to send me to kindergarten two years later to learn my alphabet. And so they homeschooled my sister and me for quite a few years using a combination of a lot of online resources at uh, the after school that my mom ran. So during the time that we weren't at Seeds of Learning, the after school and the home program and school district variety classes, my sister and I would be playing outside reading or a great deal of time surfing educational websites. I really loved uh, BBC schools where I would uh, go and read about all these BBC courses because we didn't have TV, so it would be fun to watch them. And then I would play all these really grisly history interactives like preparing a corpse for mummification. It sounds really inappropriate for a seven year old, but it was actually really fun. And <laughs> it was, you got to, well, actually, I shouldn't give the details, but it was very realistic. Not, not realistic in the sense of, oh, it's a picture, but it was an interactive and it told you a lot about the history of Egypt. That kind of stuff along the way. So all of these things that we maybe wouldn't have run into and that we maybe wouldn't have internalized so well if we were just here just reading a chapter on ancient Egypt. Um, I really learned a lot through playing games and going to websites and researching stuff that I was interested in. And I have fond memories of reading uh, the works of Russian playwright Anton Chekhov when we were studying him at the Rubik's Project Gutenberg, which is a site that distributes classic books for free. I would write opinion pieces based on CNN.com articles. I look up words I didn't know on dictionary.com or their synonyms on source.com. I would type, play typing games online, I wrote stories, so I really used my computer to pretty much everything that it could do where I tried to. And with, uh, at Seeds of Learning, the after school program that my mom ran, I had with some other students, our teacher started us on a becoming an expert project, which is sort of similar to what the five-year-olds were doing. We would pick a subject that we were interested in, mine was ancient China, and then we would do as much research about it as we could. We would look stuff up online, we would check out books from the library, and then we would write blog posts to share what we had learned with others. And we would get comments from our classmates and our teacher, and it was a really fun experience because it was one of the um, first times that I've seen that not only could I learn about a topic, I could also teach to others. I could share that information, and it gave me a greater sense of responsibility. As I said earlier, you know that when you want to teach them, you have to really understand it fully. So when I was going to write about the Qing Dynasty, I was going to know everything about the Qing Dynasty that there was to know if I could. And with, when I got feedback on my blog, it really helped me understand, here's an area that I need to work on describing more, I need to cite my sources. And I felt that this was all really more authentic than just writing paper and turning it in, because what would happen to that paper? It would just get lost in my binder, get recycled when I got home. When I wrote a blog post, I would get comments, even maybe a year afterwards, two years afterwards, that would remind me of what I had learned, and uh, I really internalized it. And creativity and uh, genuine inspiration to do this project is one thing, but pure fun is another. Another one of our projects that we did through blogging and writing was uh, a story having to do with the nations of Dnanok and Bulgad. So if you haven't heard of them, I'm not surprised, because to learn about propaganda and dictatorship who were uh, who advanced for like seven to nine year olds, now I think of it. Uh, then we created a fake nation in our season learning class, and it's called Dinanok, and it was ruled by the repressive dictator King Damocles, who was played by our teacher, Lisa. And for five or ten minutes of class time, we would all assume these various roles and goals to kind of see what would life be like under this imaginary person who's not letting you write what you want or say what you want. Uh, and so we took on these different roles. And then we created our nation's history really interactively, as only really rambunctious seven and nine year olds could. We uh, would talk about what we wanted to do, create propaganda, get arrested for speaking out. And eventually, once we select the room, we had a mock rebellion and locked her out and created a transition democratic government. So if this sounds really <laughs> frightening to you, then it was actually a genuine project. It was to learn about uh, different types of government, and propaganda, and so we actually covered things that we're supposed to learn about. Um, it was quite fun. Now, when you think about the way that you learned about things like propaganda or 
different forms of government. Then maybe it was uh, somebody writing on a blackboard, okay, here's making a chart, here's the type of government, here's what it means, here's a, a country that has a type of government, maybe you memorized that and you took a test on it, and uh, got an A, I'm assuming, and, and went on. But because we have this game, because I have a story to tell even today, I remember it better, and I have fond memories. Later, we each created our own country, we would write blog posts to describe them, and we created it very, uh, in a very real way. I even wrote a script for an imaginary newscast about my country full of dads, and much of this wasn't even assigned to me. I just went out and I wanted to do it because I was having so much fun. As a writer, I love creating stories, but this was something where I took an imaginary country and I wrote about it in a non-fiction way. So teaching me how to write persuasively, or how to write even the script for a nightly newscast, and uh, and it was for an imaginary country. So that was a pretty amazing experience. The pro these projects taught me a lot about different forms of government, about nations, about leadership, propaganda, and because I have this story, I think I can remember it better. Yes. So for those of you who say that seven-year-old children. I'd like to point out that if yeah, privacy is sorry, a concern, you can always make it private to your class or to your school. Yeah. You and that there are lots of amazing projects yeah. that you can do with you want parents or classmates commenting and reading. Okay. And uh, you get lots of you can and what and if you can finally about. call me. So growing up, some of my most powerful technologies um, you that can I can use were word processing and blogging and surfing educational websites. Okay, great. When I wrote for an audience, it helped me realize that my role was no longer just to reading and memorize and <laughs> a learner and a teacher. And I realized that I had the responsibility of teaching others or writing something that was entertaining. Today, tools like Facebook and Twitter allow me to go beyond uh, gaining knowledge and sharing it to creating events and promoting causes. Oftentimes, we hear about all the predators on Facebook and uh, how many hours students spend a day just wasting their time. But a lot of people overlook the fact that many students use Facebook as a valuable homework tool and uh, to create events. So when you're finishing homework, you might think, well, okay, Facebook can do that, but surely I can do other things. And raising the bar for tomorrow's leaders, I feel, truly means starting relevant service learning today. Who said that just because we aren't grown up yet, we can't make a difference? There's so many opportunities for students to go out, learn about our world, and make change that show us here's where your learning goes. This is why you're doing, the, why you're learning about this or that. Because here, you can volunteer here and you can make a difference in this knowledge. In September, I ran a conference called TEDx Redmond. And it's an independently organized TED event. TED is a prestigious conference in California. And it was, the speakers were all youth, 16 or under. Our organizing committee, likewise. And our attendees, we uh, sent the adults to the sign up classroom and the main audience was kids. So if you imagine a conference room just like this, and all kids in the audience and all kids speaking. It was a really powerful experience. And we heard from Zoe Sprank, the video is super quiet, so I'm not going to play. Uh, but what she said was that she had spent most of her life learning in what she said was a very boring little classroom because she saw that what she was learning it didn't have an impact on the world outside of the world or the classroom while she was in there. And she really wanted to have an impact, have an effect, have a purpose in what she was learning. And I'm organizing tonight's Redmond again this year to hear more about how we can do this, about how we can give students the opportunity to make a difference, not only inside their school, but also out. And I've had difficulty finding sponsors for TEDx Redmond, actually, because a lot of people say, well, you know, youth, they're not exactly our target audience, and we don't have a lot of spending money unless we tag on our parents' purse strings, and it doesn't seem like we hold much sway in government either, so it's hard appealing to various companies or government organizations. But people overlook the fact that youth have a huge collective voice, whether that means shopping at one particular store or not, a fan base for a superstar, yes, Justin Bieber is, uh, if, we, if youth didn't have a collective voice, then there would be a lot of stars <laughs> who wouldn't exist, uh, massive turnouts of protests. Yet at school, we're told to keep quiet, both figuratively as well as literally. And one of the most common complaints from students is that school is boring. And I think this has less to do with the idea that textbooks are fun or that uh, learning is fun, but more to do with the fact that what we do, what we learn, we don't see its uh, effects very often. So TED India speaker Kiran Mirsaki decided to change that with some experimentation. So, yeah. 